All right, Proverbs chapter 15. Now, I want you to, to pay attention to this, and I, I brought this up before in other sermons uh, with this study going through Proverbs, but we do continue to see a lot of the same concepts coming up. And pay attention. I know most of you have been here for almost every single you know, uh, week that we've been going through Proverbs, but as we continue to see these topics come up, just remember how important they are. Like that, that there's a reason why they continually come up over and over and over again through the book of Proverbs that's trying to teach you wisdom. It's, it's getting you to pay attention to this. You know, listen to this. Get the instruction. And some of the, the topics we're going to be going over again today is receiving instruction, which is something that, that has been a, a, a theme throughout the book of Proverbs. And the first subject matter we're going to be looking at is watching the words that you use and the power behind the words that you use. Again, this is something that we've gone over in the past. And as we go through these studies, I'm going to try to hit a little bit of a different angle because we see different aspects of these topics as we go through the book of Proverbs. There's, there's, there's different nuances, there's different um, reasoning behind why we need to be paying attention to these things as we go through the book. So um, you could easily go through and just do one entire sermon on you know, how, how the things that you speak and the things that you say, and you'd find tons of verses throughout just the book. You could preach one sermon just through the book of Proverbs on this one topic. But we're going to be looking through this. And again, I would, I prefer, because I've thought about this before, you know, when I'm planning and preparing how I'm going to preach my sermons, I prefer to hit these as they continually come up. There may be one or two subjects that I'll go and get all of them, like the, when I did about the scorners. There's only a few verses about that, so I'll hit them all at once. But these ones that we're going to see over and over again, we're going to keep hitting them about as often as they're coming up here because I think we need that reinforcement. We need that, that same truth to kind of get drilled into our heads. That, that, you know, if God's doing that throughout these books, you know, throughout these chapters with these, with these Proverbs going over the same subject, it's not going to hurt us to do that week after week. So, um, but I'm, you know, hopefully it's not going to be too boring for you. We are going to hit it from different angles and stuff. And I don't think anyone here gets bored by God's word anyways. I know I don't. Proverbs chapter 15. Let's look at verse number 1. The Bible reads, A soft answer turneth away wrath, but grievous words stir up anger. And this shows you how important our words can be. You know, it's, it's explaining here that you have the power to diffuse a situation. You have the, the power to turn away wrath. I mean, think about wrath. Someone's extremely angry, right? You get someone who's just irate, they're hostile maybe, and, and really angry. And if you can be humble, because look at a soft answer. What does a soft answer mean? It means you're not egging them on. You're not provoking them. You're trying to calm them down a little bit. You give a soft answer. So a good example of this in today's, in today's world, right? Maybe you accidentally cut someone off while you're driving. And that gets another person fuming. They, you know, you pull up to a red light, they get out of their car and they start yelling and they're angry and, you know, and they're really upset and they're really worked up. Well, you have a couple choices there. You could say, well, who do you think you are? You know, and just and, and go off and get, and get offended and just let your temper go just like that person let their temper go. And what's going to be the result of that? You're probably going to end up fighting, right? And I don't care how tough you are. I don't care. Oh, I can take that guy. You know, if you have this real proud attitude that you just need to prove that you're more of a man than he is, if you're not able to, to swallow your own pride for the sake of being a peacemaker, then you've got problems and, that, and you're not living a, a godly life. Because we are not called to get in the fight over every infraction that someone says to us or someone crosses us in any way. It's the wise thing to do is to give a soft answer. Oh, I'm sorry, I didn't see you there. Oh, wait, you know, hold on a second. You know, like, like settle down. A little. You know, you, you might even want to say settle down because sometimes that, that infuriates people even more. But just having using a soft answer, being humble, being able to just to to apologize or, or whatever it is, not just coming right back with a with a, a you know a fighting mentality. And you know. This is something that's, that's important to remember also with a lot of the things that we believe. And I, I have to get my, you know, check myself with this when people write comments and things like that. You get attacked so often, 
it's easy to get into defense mode and just be like, anytime anyone says anything, it's like, no, what are you, you know, and, and, and start responding just as if they're attacking you. And sometimes people aren't attacking, they're just asking a serious question or something like that. And it's harder to understand intent because you don't have all of the nonverbal communication going on on a computer screen, which is with stuff that's typed out. But normally when you're, when you're dealing with a human being face to face, you can kind of get where they're coming from. But in, that, in, in any case, when someone's you know, extremely angry with you, you, know, you ought not, you know, you, it's not going to do anyone any good to get in some kind of a physical fight. And when someone gets that angry, you know, even when you're in the right, the, you know, there's no point in escalating the situation and getting them even more more angry. The wise thing to do is to use a soft answer. It says, but grievous words stir up anger. It's real easy to get people upset and to get people angry just based on the words that you use. So, so keep, you know, pay attention to that and, and you should know yourself well enough and have been in enough situations to be able to identify, yeah, I totally see how this happens. And if you have a problem with this, you need to work on it. Look at verse number 18. Proverbs 15, verse 18. The Bible reads, a wrathful man stirreth up strife, but he that is slow to anger appeaseth strife. And this goes hand in hand with having that soft answer. When you could be slow to anger, when you're not just quick and just, just any little thing will set you off. And, and like I said, someone steps on your toe, someone, you know, whatever, you know, literally someone walks by and steps on your toe. Some people get real angry about that and will start a fight over that as opposed to being slow to anger and being more forgiving and giving more grace to people and using a soft answer. And like I said, nobody wins when you get in a physical fight. Nobody wins. I mean, even if you, you make the other guy bloody, I mean, you, that's not a win. It's, it's not. I mean, it, you, what did you really accomplish? You, you put someone else in some pain and, and, and hurt? I mean, is that really a great thing? I mean, is that, you showed him, okay, <clears throat> and now you'll probably end up being more proud for it. The Bible says in Matthew 5, 9, it's the Beatitudes. You don't have to turn there. <coughs> you say in Proverbs. <coughs> Matthew 5, verse 9 says, Blessed are the peacemakers, for they shall be called the children of God. We are, yes, we are in a battle. Yes, we're soldiers for Christ. Yes, yes, we, we you know, we ought not to be backing down to the forces of evil. We need to stand our ground. But, all of that being said, we're still to be peacemakers. We're not, we're not called, you know, like David said, you know, when I speak, I am for, you know, I, I'm for peace, but when I speak, they're for war, right. right? I mean, we want peace. We want to live as much as is possible peaceably with all men. We're not out looking to get in fights. We're not out, you know, trying to prove anything about ourselves and how manly we are and how tough we are or anything like that. We're trying to live at peace. Now, there comes a point when, you know what, yeah, there's a war going on. There's a, you know, someone breaks into your house and you don't, you know, in the middle of the night and you need to protect your family. You don't know why they're there. You assume they're there to hurt you. Yeah, go ahead and, and, and pull out your gun and shoot them, you know. Not that that's, it's not like you wanted to be in that situation when someone ultimately ends up forcing you into a situation where your only, your only recourse is going to be using force then that's fine and that's justified and there's no problem with that in the Bible. But you're not going out looking for the problem and when problems come your way, the best way to deal with them is to appease the wrath, appease the anger, use a soft tongue and, and get these, these problems to, to go away a different way than resorting to violence or um, you know, physical means. And the Bible says you're blessed if you're a peacemaker. You're going to be called the children of God. Verse number 2, go back to Proverbs 15, or you're in Proverbs 15. Verse number 2 says, The tongue of the wise useth knowledge aright, but the mouth of fools poureth out foolishness. Verse number 4, excuse me. A wholesome tongue is a tree of life, but perverseness therein is a breach of in the spirit, we ought to be speaking wholesomely, and as wholesomely is good, you know, not not perverted because that's the what it's contrasted with a wholesome tongue versus perverseness therein. And again, in in today's society, 
There's a lot of people that speak with perverted tongues. There's a lot of people that make perverted jokes. There's a lot of people that'll say things and, and take things in a way and spin them in a way, something that's completely innocent and wholesome and pure. They'll try to spin it into a, a perverted thing. And, and that's, you know, that ought, first of all, never to be coming out of your lips. But you ought not to be engaging in it and, and partaking in someone else's perverted speech either. You know, I don't care if people are going to say, oh, what are you holier than now or whatever. Look, there's certain activities that we should not be just in agreement with with anybody, no matter who it is. And I'm not saying you have to just completely just full on rebuke some lost person out there that's speaking pervertedly, but you don't laugh at their jokes. I mean, you can at least make it known. There was a time in place where people weren't getting so offended as easily, but they would just know, hey, Bob over here, he doesn't like it when you tell dirty jokes, so let's not tell dirty jokes around that guy. Whatever. It doesn't mean you have to just be, uh, uh, you know, never have any communication with people, but that you could just at least make it known, I don't appreciate that. And that's the way that we ought to be. We, we ought to be using the wholesome tongue. And this, is, this goes back towards that, the sermon I preached on Sunday morning about the lifestyle evangelism. And that, that pastor who was talking about his, his, his buddy that he made friends with, the, the lost person that was telling these off-color jokes and, and perverted jokes. And he was talking about how he just thought it was hilarious and was laughing right along with him, even when he's tested on if he's actually going to have a backbone and, and say anything and not compromise his beliefs. But no, he didn't, because he thought that that's actually a good thing to do and that people will respect what he has to say if he compromises everything he believes in. And that's totally false and wrong. No, the only way you're going to get anybody to give you any type of respect or listen to what you have to say is if you're consistent, if you're not a hypocrite, if you don't compromise, if you could say, this is what I believe and this is what I do, and they line up. And I'll tell you what, I know that firsthand. When I was, uh, after I got saved, but was not living righteously, I'd, I'd, from time to time, I'd try going to churches. And, you know, you go through you kind of your ups and downs and be like, man, I really got to get into church. I know this is right. I know I need to be doing stuff different. And, you, and you'd make an effort and then you backslide. And at least in my life, I was kind of going back and forth of trying to make an effort and then backslide and forgetting all about it. And during those times, I'd be going and trying different churches. And it's like, you, you hear one thing and then you see something else. You know, you hear one thing being taught that was okay, not real fiery or anything, but then you see, you see the pastor, you see everyone else in the church is all, nobody's like taking heed to the message at all. And that turned me off. That made me just like, what am I doing here? You're not saying much of anything and the things that you are saying, no one's really, no one's really adhering. Why, why would I want to be a part of that group? I don't want to be associated with just a bunch of hypocrites. Now, I wasn't some righteous living person at all, but, but anybody, I mean, you walk in a situation like that, no one's going to give you any type of credit at all or credibility to what you have to say. You know, it wasn't until I finally ended up at Faith Forward Baptist Church and I heard the preaching and it was great. Like, oh man, this is great. You're someone actually teaching the Bible, like, like reading more than one verse. I can't tell you how irritating it is to go to church and to hear one Bible verse and then a talking for 30 minutes to an hour. That is the most irritating. I don't know. When did that ever get popular? When, who, when did that start? Because I don't understand how you can call that. I know I'm going off on a rabbit trail now. But I don't care. How could you ever call that preaching and say, yeah, we're, we're learning God's word as you read one verse? One verse. Unbelievable. No, when you, when you come to church, you ought to be hearing a lot of verses and digging into God's word and saying, what are we going to learn here? So when I, when I heard that, and I was like, oh man, this is great. You know, he read an entire chapter. Could you imagine that? Normally you read maybe three or four verses just in the little context and they preach on one of them. I was like, I was blown away the first time I went there. I was like, we're reading the whole chapter. Like, this is awesome. This is awesome. You know, because even if you don't agree with what they're saying, at least you're reading a whole chapter in church, right? And, and, you know, I heard the messages like, man, this guy's got a lot of zeal. But it wasn't until I start to get to know the guy and it's like, he's living just exactly what he's preaching. He's not saying anything that he doesn't do himself. That is motivating. That is inspiring. And that ups the credibility of what I'm hearing of saying, okay, you're not just saying this, you're doing it too. So I'm going to listen to what you have to say because I have respect to someone that can at least do that. 
Even if you don't agree with them on everything, you can at least respect the position that they're taking. You know, when people come and they'll have an argument against anything that I believe, I have a lot more respect to the person who is very consistent in what they believe, as opposed to the people who are all over the place and they just don't believe this because they don't like it. And, you know, you try to show them, well, there's a stark contradiction here then in, the, in, in your belief system and, and they don't care because they're just picking and choosing what they want to believe. And, um, you know, there's a member of our church that we're talking to about another pastor who, at least they're consistent, you know, and they're saved and everything else, but they have disagreements on some of the things that we teach here. But having at least some form of consistency, you could take things all the way to the logical end. I'll say, okay, yeah, you know what? It's like I was preaching on the Calvinism, for example. Uh, you know, someone who's just like kind of slightly Calvinistic, it's like, you know what? No, you're either you know, a hyper-Calvinist, like just take it all the way to the logical end. I have a lot more respect for that person who just says, nope, you know, this is, you see it all the way through to the end than the person who's just kind of dabbling in it a little bit and saying, well, you know, I have a lot more respect for the person who could just, just take it all the way out. I mean, just, just say, if this is the way it is and this is the way it is and stand by that. And that's, that's where you're going to get the credibility and we ought to be able to stand on God's word. Now, um, what did that have to do? I mean, obviously, using a wholesome tongue and everything, the Bible says, you know, we, we ought not to be uh, engaged with the, the perverseness and have a breach in our spirit by preaching things or by saying things that, that aren't right, that aren't wholesome, that aren't um, godly. Turn, if you would, to verse 23 here. We're in Proverbs 15. Look, at, look down at verse number 23. We're on the topic of, of how powerful our words can be. Verse 23 reads, A man hath joy by the answer of his mouth, and a word spoken in due season. How good is it? And this is, again, we're going back to the power of, of how our words can be. A, a word spoken says in due season, just like at the right time. You know, how, how good is that? You have, a, you have a friend that's just real down and out and having a hard time, and you speak the right words to him. You speak some good words to them. It can, it can really have an impact and change that person's course or, or really lift them up quite a bit from where they're at to have a significant change in their life just by using your words. You know, oftentimes we think of the, we have the prayer request, you know, we pray for people and I'm often thinking, man, you know, what can I do to help certain people? You know, I really want to help them. And, and sometimes you get stuck in a way of thinking that like, well, we don't have very much money. I mean, we're already struggling to get by and I really want to do something for this person, but what they need is going to require, you know, X amount of dollars. And I just, I simply don't have that because I'm trying to, you know, but we often forget that, you know, a word fitly spoken sometimes is going to be worth way more than anything you can purchase and give to that person. And don't ever forget that. Don't think that, like, even though you have this, this heart of wanting to help somebody out, you know, do what you can. You know, no, not many people in this church are, you know, have a lot of money. But we all have tongues. There's no one in here that's mute. Everybody can speak. And, and especially with all the problems, I mean, you see our prayer list is filled up. We're a really small church and we've got a full prayer list. Talk to the people, especially the people that are in need, and, and, and speak to them and, and use your mouth for good. Devise good. Remember that from last week? Devise good. Think about it and plan it and say, you know what? I know this person's struggling in this area. I'm going to make, I'm going to make a point I'm going to make a plan to talk to that person and just, you know, try to, try to comfort them or try to edify them, try to build them up a little bit, try to, try to help them to grow in a certain area that I think is going to be good for them. That's a word spoken in due season. How good is it? Uh, let's look at verse number seven. I know we're jumping around, but I'm trying to keep the topic here um, in focus. Of, of our words and the words that we use. Look at verse number 7 of Proverbs 15. The lips of the wise disperse knowledge, but the heart of the foolish doeth not so. The lips of the wise, what does it mean to disperse knowledge? It means you're giving it out. You're, 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 you're spreading it out, right? You're dispersing the knowledge that you have. The, you know, it's a good thing to, to be able to distribute or to disperse the knowledge that you have. Don't keep it just for yourself. When you know something, you've learned something, hey, share that with other people. You know, spread it out. It says, but the heart of the foolish doeth not so. Verse number 28, Proverbs 15, 28. The Bible reads, The heart 
of the righteous studieth to answer, but the mouth of the wicked poureth out evil things. The heart of the righteous studieth to answer. We all ought to be study. You know, and this, this isn't this isn't talking about the pastor in particular. This isn't talking about any one particular person in a church. This is for everybody. I mean, this is wisdom here. It says the heart of the righteous. Are you righteous? Is your heart righteous? Then you ought to be studying to answer. And where are we going to get our answers from? We're going to get the answers from the Word of God. So there's always going to be people that have questions. There's always going to be people that want to know the truth about all kinds of topics. And we need to be studying to give an answer. See, it's not enough just to, to have an answer, to give an answer. Anybody could give an answer. You want to have the right answer, which is why you need to study. Because you don't want to just give your opinion. I mean, everybody has an opinion. But study to know what you're talking about, to say that this is, this is the answer. And uh, you know, just like the Bible says in 2 Timothy 2.15, which is the quote that's going on to our, our awesome painting that uh, Angelica painted for us, study to show thyself approved unto God. A workman that needeth not to be ashamed, rightly dividing the word of truth. Amen. To have the right answer, you need to be studying and not studying to show yourself approved unto other church members, not studying to show yourself approved unto the pastor, not studying to show yourself approved unto anyone but unto God. That's who you need to be worried about. Now think about that. Think about when you study, if you studied for an exam, you've studied for a class that you've had in college or in school or whatever. You study, and ultimately you're studying for the approval of your teacher, right? Which, I, know about, I don't know about you, but I've had plenty of teachers in my day that I didn't have very much respect for, and it's just kind of like, whatever. Right? And many times, a lot of people would not study at all, but they'd end up cheating or whatever, because you know, there's no respect there. But if you're studying to show yourself approved unto God, how serious should you be taking that study? And there's a lot of things that you can think about with this when, when you're studying God's Word. I'm not against using tools. I like using tools, the digital tools. Now you have apps on your phone. I've got a Bible app on my phone. You can search. You could find keywords. You could find things really quickly. But if we're studying, and, and that's great, and I'm not saying not to use those things, but what I am saying is don't rely on those tools that are so easily, you know, easy to use and quick at the fingertips as a replacement for the study that you ought to be doing in God's Word. Where you're just relying on that all the time to get all of your information in a real quick search here. It's, it's, I mean, it's similar to the concept of kids these days just using calculators instead of actually learning how to do math. Learning how to add, learning how to subtract, learning how to do calculus, learning how to do all these different things. There's a value to that. And, and when you study something like that, you know it so much better than when you just go to some device and type it in. And even me as a pastor, I need to make sure that I don't get too wrapped up into using these searches all the time because it makes it easier. It makes my job easier in, in figuring things out. But in the end, that's not more, you know, what's more valuable is having the whole Bible, you know, more at my, in my mind to be able to say, I don't need this tool to figure out where that passage is because I know where that passage is. And if I know where they are, that means it's in my heart a lot more than just, oh, I think I heard something about that. So we need to study. And, and if, we're, if we're trying to be approved by God, God's not going to be impressed with, with how good you are at using the search bar. He's going to be impressed with what you actually know and how much you've actually studied His Word. We need to study to show ourselves approved unto God. And we are workmen. How are we workmen? Well, we preach, we're supposed to be preaching the gospel to people. We're supposed to be showing other people how to get saved. We're workmen that needeth not to be ashamed. And you know what? It is a shame. And I remember when I first started out soul winning, and again, don't use this as a reason not to go out and preach the gospel, but... It, it, it goes along with learning and being a beginner versus, versus you know, being more studied and, and more ready to answer. But I remember plenty of times having people stump me, right? You, so you get in a conversation with someone and they, and they start you know, questioning you and, and, and wanting to know, well, wait, what about this? What about that? And many times I used to have, I don't know. But, and that was kind of a shame to me because I was like, well, I know I'm right. 
but I can't explain to this person why. Because I didn't study enough. Because I didn't have the verses ready. Because I wasn't able to, to explain it properly from the Scripture. And what I would do, when I was done at that door, I'd write, I'd write down whatever it was that I got stumped on. Because then I would go home and I would study that out. And then I'd even you know, write down the references in my Bible or whatever so that it didn't happen again. Because I don't want to be ashamed. And this is the way that we all ought to be. We, we ought to be workmen that need not to be ashamed. And again, if you're a beginner, there's nothing wrong with being a beginner. Okay? Someone's going to stump you. Okay. But the, the key is, what are you doing with that? Are you going to let that defeat you? And then, you well, I'm never going out again because someone just made me look like a fool. Or are you going to say, I'm not going to let that happen again. I'm going to study more about this so that I can have these answers. And of course, studying is going to help you to rightly divide the word of truth. It's the more you study, the more you know the Bible, you're going to, the more you're going to realize how much everything fits together and how much it needs to fit together where you can't just, you know, if someone comes at you then with a doctrine, it might sound pretty good, but then you say, well, wait, wait, wait. If that's true, then that contradicts this other doctrine in another area of the Bible. It, you want to be able to spot those things. 1 Peter 3.15 says, But sanctify the Lord God in your hearts, and be ready always to give an answer to every man that asketh you a reason of the hope that is in you with meekness and fear. We have a hope in us, right? We have a hope of salvation. And, and don't, don't, be distracted, you know, don't be worried about that word hope. It doesn't mean that it's any less secure, that it's any, you know, uh, any doubt. We often think of the word hope, which, which today people use the word as if there's some kind of doubt associated with it. There's no doubt in hope. Hope just means that it hasn't happened yet. It's going to happen in the future. That's where our hope is. You can say that's where our faith is, right? It doesn't make it any, you know, any less secure just because you use the word hope. But we do have a hope inside of us. We have the hope of salvation, the salvation of our bodies, and you know, our soul has already been saved. But ultimately, that hope is within us, and we need to be able to give an answer to anyone that asks us about that. Anyone that asks you about salvation, you need to have a clear answer for them, and the only way that you can do that is through studying. And if you are newer to soul winning, you need to study the verses that you're going to use to give to people. You have to do it. And I don't want to get too far in depth on the whole soul winning thing. I'm going to be, I, I'm, you know what, I'm going to teach on that again coming up here real soon so that uh, people could have a good understanding of what is expected of you by God to be able to be effective at your soul winning. And one of those things is being able to give an answer. And um, you don't need to know everything, every detail about every single doctrine in the whole Bible. But know about the soul winning verses. Know about salvation by grace, not of works. Know about eternal life, the eternal security. Of the, you know, know about, about these types of things. Know about Jesus Christ, of course. Know about His perfectly sinless life. Know about His deity. Know about Him being God in the flesh. Know about these things in order to effectively give the gospel, in order to be able to give an answer. Because those, all of those, all those topics pertain to to um, being able to give an answer of the hope that's in you. So we're going to shift gears here. We're going to go back up to verse number 3 here in Proverbs 15. The Bible reads, The eyes of the Lord are in every place, beholding the evil and the good. And that's a good warning, a good reminder to have that God sees everything. It doesn't matter where you're at. And, you know, oftentimes, I think this is where people get in a lot of trouble is when you think you're all alone. You think no one will ever find out. And that is the most likely place for, for sin, especially major sins, to occur. For example, you know, like adulteries. You could think, oh man, my wife thinks I'm at work. I have this perfect opportunity. It's late. It's dark. No one else is around. No one sees what's going on. And you, could, you think you could just go and, and it's the perfect crime. Right? I could get away with this and no one will ever know. Or you're sitting at home and, and, and you're all alone and you've got your computer and you could go on and visit whatever wicked, perverted sites you want to go on or whatever. And you think that, well, no one's going to know. This is my little secret. This is my little pet sin. God knows. God sees it all. And, and you be sure your sin will find you out. And, and remember verses like this, the eyes of the Lord are in every place, beholding the evil and the good. 
Now, I was referencing the evil there because we need to remember that, that God will see all of the evil things that we do and that we will be held accountable for those things that it, we can't just say no one knows about it. But keep this in mind, he also sees the good. Okay, and, and that's a good comfort. Right? There's a warning against the evil, but a comfort for the good. I mean, there's many times you could find yourself in a situation where nobody will ever know what you ever did to help somebody else out, to do good in a certain area, to, to, you know, to, to just be honest, to be upright. And, and no one else in the whole world might ever know that you did something like that, but God does. And God will bless you for that. Just as much as God will make sure that you're chastened and you're disciplined for the evil that you do in secret, God will also make sure that you're rewarded for the things that you do in secret. He says, do not your alms be seen of men. Right? And then he goes on to explain, you know, let not your left hand know what your right hand doeth. And he says that God which seeth in secret shall reward thee openly. The things that you do that are good, God sees all of it. Proverbs 15, look at verse 11. The Bible reads, Hell and destruction are before the Lord. How much more than the hearts of the children of men? Not only does God see the things that you do in secret, God knows the thoughts of your heart. God knows the things that you think. God knows what's going on even in your head. You don't even have to verbally say anything. And again, talk about keeping yourself, you know, approved unto God <laughs> to try to keep your, your thoughts and, and everything pure. And look, I know it's a hard task, but we, the more mindful you are of it, the more you realize any time you have a bad thought, a perverted thought, a, a, a sinful, wicked, foolish thought, just remember, God knows, God knows about that. And, and, and use that to help you to say, you know what, I need to, be, you know, I need to be thinking about something else. I can't be thinking about these things. I need to get my thought life right. Hebrews 4.12 says, For the word of God is quick and powerful and sharper than any two-edged sword, piercing even to the dividing asunder of soul and spirit and, the joint, and of the joints and marrow, and is a discerner of the thoughts and intents of the heart. God's word is a, is a, is a piercing sword. And... It, goes, it cuts all the way through to the thoughts and the intents of the heart. It says in the next verse, Neither is there any creature that is not manifest in his sight, but all things are naked and opened unto the eyes of him with whom we have to do. God sees everything. Let's look at verse number 5 here. We're going to shift gears again to another, another uh, subtopic within this chapter, going back on the topic of instruction and being able to receive instruction. Verse 5 says, A fool despiseth his father's instruction, but he that regardeth reproof is prudent. You ought to be able to be corrected. Verse number 12, A scorner loveth not one that reproveth him, neither will he go unto the wise. That's a scorner, someone that has a stiff neck, someone who, who you can't tell what, you know, what to do, or you can't tell him what's right, because he won't accept it. It says, neither will he go unto the wise. Verse number 14, the heart of him that hath understanding seeketh knowledge, but the mouth of fools feedeth on foolishness. And then look at verse number 10. The Bible reads, correction is grievous unto him that forsaketh the way, and he that hateth reproof shall die. That's a strong verse. That is very strongly worded there, saying that, you know what, correction is grievous. It means you don't like it. It, 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 it. It's upsetting unto him that forsaketh the way. Just like correction was grievous for my child today that disobeyed me and had to get a spanking, it was grievous, right? That correction was grievous because she went out of the way. But it says, he that hateth reproof shall die. If you hate being reproved and being told that you're wrong, if you just can't handle it and you just despise it and you never want anyone to tell you that what you're doing is wrong, the Bible says you're going to die. Right. And it's true. People that just can't ever be told that they're wrong, that can't ever be told... Because look, we're all wrong from time to time. Right. Everybody. I know it's hard to believe, but I'm even wrong sometimes. <laughs> Just kidding. Um, I'm never wrong. <laughs> gotcha. Yeah. We're all wrong. 
And we all ought to have an attitude that's, that's able to be corrected. We need to be able to be reproved. And if you hate being reproved, I mean, how, how much more of, a, of an instruction do you need than he that hath reproof shall die? I mean, do you value your own life? Then you ought to be able to value receiving some type of correction, some type of reproof and, uh, and rebuking. Jump down to verse number 31. The Bible reads, The ear that heareth the reproof of life abideth among the wise. He that refuseth instruction despiseth his own soul. But he that heareth reproof getteth understanding. The fear of the Lord is the instruction of wisdom, and before honor is humility. It says here now, if you refuse instruction, you can't have anyone tell you what to do, you hate your own soul. Which, it makes sense with, you're going to die. I mean, if you... If you're, if you're willing to not receive correction and the Bible says that, hey, you're gonna, I mean, this is going to kill you, then you must hate your own soul because it's going to kill you. And then in verse 33 there, I, I read this already, but um, it says the fear of the Lord is the instruction of wisdom and before honor is humility. And we need to keep that in mind. And that, that goes any time in your life before honor is you need to be humble. You need to be able, to, and, and part of being humble is being able to receive correction, being able to receive instruction, being able to be told this is the right way and you're doing it wrong. If you can receive that though, yeah, you'll receive honor. You'll be walking in the way of righteousness. You'll be doing what's right and you will have honor bestowed unto you, but that's not going to come until you're humble first. The proud man doesn't get honor. They may think they get honor. They may get, get some fake honor, from, from you know, the lost world, from the children of men. But the, the real honor that you're going to receive is going to come from the Lord. And you're only going to get that through humility, through being humble. Look at verse number 22. Verse number 22, going along with our, with our topic of receiving instruction. Without counsel, purposes are disappointed, but in the multitude of counselors they are established. This is talking about getting advice, counsel, being counseled on a certain thing. It says, without counsel, purposes are disappointed. So you have a plan, you want to do something, and you seek no advice, no counsel from anyone else. You just think that, nope, everything I do, I know, you know, I know better than everyone else, and I'm just going to do it my way, and I don't need to hear what anyone else has to say about it. The Bible says your purposes will be disappointed. But the multitude of counselors, they are established. It's good to seek good advice and good godly advice. And I'll tell you this much, if you go to seek advice, <laughs> don't just discount what's given to you. If, you like, if you're going to someone that you respect and someone that, that, that you appreciate their, their opinion and you're going to hear it, don't go just trying to confirm what you think you already know. Go to seek what they have to say. And don't just go to one person, you know, in the multitude of counselors, go to many people that you respect. Now, I've, teach, you know, I've taught an entire sermon on, on this, on receiving godly counsel. Um, be careful who you're getting your counsel from. You want to get it from someone who, who knows their Bible pretty well. Look for the people in the church that, that you can speak to and, and they evidently are reading their scripture and, and they know the Bible really well and they are already exhibiting wisdom. That's who you want to get your counsel from. But don't ever, you, know, you don't feel like you have to just go to one person. And like I said, if you, you know, when you go to seek counsel, if, you, you know, if, you see, if you've seen the wisdom exhibited by the people in the past, you might not always understand the answers, you know, like depending on where you're at. But... Um, Take that into consideration, the counsel that you receive, especially people that, that love you and that, that, are, that are looking for your best interest, as well as, you know, being able to provide truth from Scripture. Now, obviously, you don't ever just follow anyone blindly. It ought to be able to line up, but if what they're saying makes sense, and if you could see it here, then, then don't disregard the counsel. And don't be so proud that you can't go yourself to seek counsel from people. Let's uh, jump up here to verse number 13. We're going to shift gears again on another topic. And uh, this topic's about having a merry heart. Look at verse number 13. A merry heart maketh a cheerful countenance, but by sorrow of the heart the spirit is broken. All the, or verse 15. All the days of the afflicted are evil, but he that is of a merry heart hath a continual feast. And, you know, we read... 
How Jesus Christ was a man of sorrows. We read how, you know, yea, and all that live godly shall suffer persecution and stuff. And, and, and we kind of get down on that. But God does want you to have joy. God wants you to have a merry heart. There's, there's plenty of times, and you know, when we read those verses, we, we focus on them a lot because you need to remember, hey, this stuff's going to happen not to defeat you so that you're ready to be and prepared to deal with it when it comes. But that being said, it's not like your, your life is just all doom and gloom all the time and that you can never have a merry heart. God has given us many things to allow for us to have a merry heart. I mean, just think about your spouse. Your spouse ought to be providing you a merry heart. That's something that you can enjoy and, and your children that you have and, and even eating food and drinking juice and having these, you know, just simple pleasures. God has given you these things to help your heart be merry and to give you joy in your life. And, you know, even the Spirit, you know, one of the fruits of the Spirit is joy. God wants us to experience joy in this life. Look at verse number 16. The Bible says, Better is little with the fear of the Lord than great treasure and trouble therewith. Better is a dinner of herbs where love is than a stalled ox and hatred therewith. And this is teaching us many things. Actually, these, both of these verses are, are real dense. But in order to have a merry heart, for one, you can't be discontent with the things that you have. Right. You will never be happy. You will never have a merry heart if you're constantly looking at other things and, and not satisfied where you're at. That's why the Bible says, better is little. Having little good, little substance with the fear of the Lord. That's much better to not have anything as long as you're fearing God because you're going to be doing what's right and walking righteously. It says, then great treasure and trouble therewith. What good is your great... Because here's the thing. You won't be satisfied by your great treasure if you're doing it in a way that's not pleasing to God and you're not walking uprightly and God's constantly chastising you and disciplining you as a child of God. What, you know, then you're, you're going to be doubly worse for you. Think about that. Think about you know, how easy it could be to be tempted and distracted with making a lot of money, with being focused on the goods of this world. But then that means, well... I'm going to have to skip some church. I'm not going to be able to go soul winning. I'm not really going to be able to read my Bible that much. I mean, you know, and, and you just have to cut out all of this stuff that God expects of you to do as, as, his, as his child. You say, well, I'm going to have to lose that stuff, but hey, at least I'll be comfortable. At least I'll, I'll be able to do this. I'll be able to do that. I'll, you know. God could bring trouble your way. What good is all of that treasure that you might make? How, how happy is that really going to make you when God is chastising you? When God is disciplining you, it's going to be worthless. You're going to be thinking, man, I just wasted my time getting all this riches because I'm not even enjoying it anyways. Instead of building up treasures for myself in heaven, that it's never going to go bad. And I'd be doing what's right and not being disciplined of God. It's, it's a double whammy. And then verse 17, better is a dinner of herbs where love is. And especially married people, families, pay attention to this. Better is a dinner of herbs where love is. You know how much, I mean, financial problems break up marriages all the time. And people fight about this and, and it becomes such a stressful part of life. Both of you need to be able to be content saying, I mean, a dinner of herbs, that's not very much. I mean, we're talking a salad, right? I say, but I want my steak and I want my potatoes and I want my vegetables and I want, you know, Hey, if you have love, that's way better to, to just be content and, and be able to enjoy each other. Hey, say, you know what? We don't have very much. All we could afford is, is this salad, and we're going to eat dinner, but at least we have each other. At least we have our family. At least we have our faith. At least we have God. Isn't God good? Amen. That's going to bring you joy. That is going to make your heart merry. That is the way that you're going to want to live. That's going to reduce the stress in your life, and literally that will make you live longer if you have that type of an attitude. Instead of being so focused on the stupid money that we don't need anyways and say, well, we need this and we need that and you feel entitled to everything and, and get you distracted and drawn away into a direction that even when you get the money, then you're still not going to be happy because you have the wrong attitude. Right. Because you have the wrong attitude. You need to be able to be satisfied with the dinner of herbs where love is. It says then a stalled ox. I mean, you've got this big old... You know, Slaughter the, the, the big old ox and, and serve it up and have a seven-course meal and, and 
hatred therewith. And you just hate each other. And the husband's going, I had to work all this hard, and I worked all this hard. You know, for, you know, I hope you choke on it. Here's your stinking fancy meal. <laughs> it's way better to just sit down and have a salad with someone and, and just enjoy each other's company. Look at verse number 30. The Bible reads, The light of the eyes rejoiceth the heart, and a good report maketh the bones fat. <clears throat> it's good to bring good news unto people, a good report. It's, you know, it's, a, it's a good, just bringing good news. Reports, it's the news, you know, telling people good things that happen. And it, it says it makes the bone fat. The light of the eyes rejoiceth the heart. And um, visiting people. You know, the light of the eyes, seeing, being able to see the person face to face. And I know that the Bible wasn't thinking of, like, as opposed to a phone call. But, you know, even as opposed to writing a letter or whatever, you know, a form of communication, the light of the eyes will rejoice the heart. It's good to see old friends. It's good to see people face to face. And, um, you know, sometimes we need to make sure that that's, that's also a priority from time to time to be able to go and, and visit people um, that, that can use some visiting. We're going to look at verse number 24 here. The Bible reads, The way of life is above to the wise that he may depart from hell beneath. Make a decision on the path you are going to take in life. And, and I think everyone here probably already has, but we need to be able to, to, again, take a step back and ponder these things and think about where are you going? Where's my life headed? What am I going to do? Have a plan for yourself. Think this is my destination. You know, this world is not my home. I'm just a passing through. And to have that type of a mindset on the things that are above, get your heart settled on it. Receive the wisdom from God's Word to point you in that right direction. And, you know, the way of life you're going to find in the Bible. And that's above to the wise. The way of life is not here. The way of life is in heaven. Yeah. And that's the things that we need to be focused on and worried about as opposed to all of the other um, things that we get distracted with in this, in this earth. Look at verse number 6. In the house of the righteous is much treasure, but in the revenues of the wicked is trouble. Say, well, wait, 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 what do you mean there? Are you preaching a prosperity gospel? The house of the righteous is much treasure? Yeah, they think about that word treasure. And I'm not, yeah, I'm preaching a prosperity gospel. Okay, don't. <laughs> I misspoke. There is much treasure in the house of the righteous. But what is the true treasure anyways? It's not the silver and the gold. And that's not what this is teaching here either, is that you're going to have a lot of silver and gold if you're righteous. The, real, the true treasure is going to be found in heaven, where moth and rot don't, don't corrupt. And, and that, is, that is evident throughout the Bible. That is always taught. And the house of the righteous is much treasure. You lay up much treasure for yourself in heaven when you're living a righteous life. It says, but then the revenues of the wicked is trouble. Verse number 8. Look at verse number 8. The Bible reads, The sacrifice of the wicked is an abomination to the Lord, but the prayer of the upright is his delight. The way of the wicked is an abomination unto the Lord, but he loveth him that followeth after righteousness. And when I was studying and reading these verses, one of the things that came to mind, it says here, the sacrifice of the wicked. What's a sacrifice? A sacrifice is giving a sacrifice unto God. Right? You're offering something up to God. And he's saying, if you're living a wicked life, the sacrifices that you make, it's an abomination. One of the things that comes to mind is I think of you know, the Catholic Church and a lot of Catholics that they want to live their wicked lifestyle. They don't care about you. Know, they're going to sin and sin and sin, but then they're going to go and, and bring their sacrifice. Right? They might show up to church and they'll, they'll say their confession or whatever it is that, it is, that, that their sacrifice is. And thinking that they're just all of a sudden right with God with no repentance, no intense intent to change, just going to go back out the next day, the next week, and do all the same things and kind of repeat, right? And then bring the little sacrifice. And it's the same way even in the Old Testament. People would, would I mean, if they, if they weren't repenting and they just continued on their same life, but they brought their little animal sacrifice. Those animal sacrifices, you know, I hate to tell you, you know, but the, the Bible says that they never, they cannot take, you know, the blood of sin, of, of bulls and of goats cannot take away sin. They've never been able to take away sin. It was, it was something that was commanded. It was part of the law. It was something they were supposed to do. But that's not what, what really got them right with God anyways. It's the repentant heart. And people who want to, 
to give sacrifices or maybe they put a whole bunch of money in the place. If you're living a wicked life, that's an abomination. God just hates that even more. He's saying, you know, what do you think I could be bought off? What do you think all of a sudden just because you offered this animal because you think you're making some sacrifice and I'm pleased with you, that actually makes God even more angry. He says, that's an abomination. I hate when people do that. So if you're going to live your stinking wicked lifestyle, then just keep living it and have, you know, just, just face it. I'm not a part of your life. Don't pretend like I am. Don't pretend like you're making some big sacrifice unto me. And I think of even in Genesis with Cain and Abel. The Bible refers to both of them bringing an offering. Verse 3 of Genesis 4 reads, And in process of time it came to pass that Cain brought of the fruit of the ground an offering unto the Lord. It's a sacrifice. He went out and he was growing his, his fruits and his vegetables and, and he brought the, the, whatever it is that he had and brought it as an offering unto God. He said, Here you go, God. Look, I went out. I worked hard. I gathered all this for you. Here you go. And Abel, he also brought of the firstlings of his flock and of the fat thereof. And the Lord had respect unto Abel and to his offering, but unto Cain and to his offering he had not respect. And Cain was very wroth, and his countenance fell. And the Lord said unto Cain, Why art thou wroth, and why is thy countenance fallen? If thou doest well, shalt thou not be accepted. And if thou doest not well, sin lieth at the door. And unto thee shall be his desire, and thou shalt rule over him. Cain brought the wrong sacrifice, the wrong offering, and his heart wasn't right with God either because you see here he gets angry. And we don't have all the information here, you know, all completely spelled out, but God doesn't expect, you know, get angry at people that, that if he had never given them any understanding whatsoever that he expected an animal sacrifice. Like he didn't just get mad at Cain for no reason that just like, well, how could you even get mad because he was completely ignorant and you never told him, God. God must have told him. He must have told him that he expected that type of an offering, just like he did with the incense that was offered before him when Nadab and Abihu died. That was spelled out for them, and they decided, hey, let's do this for God. Let's offer this fire here before him instead of what he told us to do. God must have told Cain and Abel what he expected of them. But Cain decided, you know what? I'm not, a, I, I'm not in a husbandry. I don't have the, you know, whatever animals. I prefer to do the fruits of the ground. I'm, I'm into agriculture. I want to offer God my offering. And God said, no. I'm not accepting your offering. The other example that came to mind is in uh, 1 Samuel 15 with, uh, with Saul. And um, Saul offering up the, uh, the sacrifice. And when they had, they had just defeated um, one of the cities, that God told them to completely wipe it out. Kill all the animals, kill all the people, you know, don't leave anyone alive, just burn it all to the ground, destroy it all. And um, when Saul came back, you know, they took the best of the, of the sheep, the best of the oxen, the best of everything to offer up a sacrifice unto God. And... Um, Samuel, you know, was like, what are you doing? You know, what is all this stuff? That you're not doing what you were told to do. And uh, in verse 22, Samuel says unto Saul, Hath the Lord as great delight in burnt offerings and sacrifices as in obeying the voice of the Lord? Behold, to obey is better than sacrifice and to hearken than the fat of rams. For rebellion is as the sin of witchcraft and stubbornness is as iniquity and idolatry. Because thou hast rejected the word of the Lord, he hath also rejected thee from being king. And you can see how these concepts are all tied together. So we see the sacrifice of the wicked is an abomination we saw in Proverbs 15. We see here that God's actually looking for us to obey our obedience than the sacrifices anyways, that God's not as concerned about the sacrifice. Hey, you want to make a sacrifice? Great. God sees what you do in secret. You want to make a sacrifice? Do it in secret. God will see that. He'll reward you openly. You don't need to be seen of men. He doesn't need the sacrifice, though. He'd rather have your obedience, and when you're not obedient, you're in rebellion. And the Bible says that rebellion is as a sin of witchcraft. And stubbornness is as iniquity. Well, stubborn, someone who can't be told they're wrong. Saul had a real hard time with this. He was one that couldn't be told that he was wrong. He was not able to receive instruction. He could not receive correction. And you know what happened to him? He died. He died in battle. As appointed by God, he couldn't receive the instruction. He hated being told he was wrong. When Samuel told me he was wrong, he said, no, I'm not. 
I mean, multiple times he's like, I didn't do anything wrong. Yes, I did follow God's commandment. I did do what was right. You can't tell me I did anything wrong. That was the attitude that Saul had. He died. This one story fits with like everything we've already covered here in Proverbs chapter 15. But let's keep reading. I'm going to... We're almost done. Verse number 19. Verse number 19, Proverbs 15. The Bible says, The way of the slothful man is an hedge of thorns, but the way of the righteous is made plain. You see, a slothful man's not going to want to go out there and, and clean up the path. So he's just going to have all the thorns grow up. And what's going to happen to the thorns? They're going to tear you. They're going to cut you. And um, it's not going to work out well for you just because you're so stinking lazy you can't get up and do any work. Verse number 20, a wise, man, a wise son maketh a glad father, but a foolish man despiseth his mother. Verse 21, folly is joy to him that is destitute of wisdom. There's so many people that think that you know, their own foolishness is providing joy for them. And I know what this is like too. When I was destitute of wisdom, and I thought that, that my foolishness was joy. That was the only joy I knew. I didn't know real joy. And that's the thing. When you get caught up in your sins and you just think, hey, acting the fool this is a lot of fun. You know, we're having a great, let's go have a great time and act like fools. A lot of people get caught up in that. And like I said, I know that from experience. But it's because I was destitute of wisdom. I was an idiot. I was a fool. And... What's, what's interesting is that the joy that you do receive from being a fool isn't really joy anyway. I mean, it's really nothing compared to living the righteous life and receiving the joy of the Spirit. It says, But a man of understanding walketh uprightly. Verse 25. Verse 25. The Lord will destroy the house of the proud, but he will establish the border of the widow. The thoughts of the wicked are an abomination to the Lord, but the words of the pure our pleasant words. Again, God's knowing our thoughts. And he's saying, even the thoughts of the wicked are abomination. Verse 27, He that is greedy of gain troubleth his own house, but he that hateth gifts shall live. And this is the last point I think I'm going to make for the chapter is just on this concept of gifts. You say, well, wait a minute. What do you mean he that hateth gifts shall live? Say, I like getting gifts. I like when it's my birthday. I like when it's Christmas. I like getting gifts. What's wrong with that? That's not what this is talking about. Because that's not what this, what this verse talks about. When we're talking about gifts, and I'm going to give you a few references here. If you want to turn to Proverbs 29, we're in, in, in chapter 15. We're going to skip ahead here to verse 29. What this is referring to about receiving gifts is talking about bribes. It's talking about people you know, influencing and changing your judgment, your righteous judgment, by doing favors for you, by giving you things, by being able to buy you and buy your favor from, from, you know, from people who are in a position to give a righteous judgment. Look at verse number 4 of Proverbs 29. The Bible says, The king by judgment establisheth the land. The land will be established. It will be settled when the king gives his judgment. But then the verse continues, But he that receiveth gifts overthroweth it. Your kingdom's going to come to nothing when you're just beholden to anybody that's willing to give you a bribe. You're not really in authority then. The people who are bribing you are the ones in the power. Right? I mean, in order for a king to, to be in control and to establish his kingdom and to be the one in charge, you can't be accepting bribes from other people because now all of a sudden they're buying you out. They get that control. I mean, you think about our, our, our government today. Our, the, the, the congressmen and congresswomen, they're not really in charge. The president is not really in charge because they're all bought out, because they're all being bribed. I mean, you look at wicked Bernie Sanders, the socialist, that had all these people. Oh, he's this great intellectual, and he's, you know, he, he's for the common man, and he's for the people, and, and he wants everyone to have everything for free, and the government's going to take care of it all, and he has this great voice, and he has these convictions, and he's never going to back down, and he, you know, he's against the establishment and everything. He quits his campaign, he endorses the establishment, and then he goes out and buys himself another vacation house with all the money that was donated to him from the people who actually believed in what he had to say. It's just a sellout. Nothing. And you know what? That's not a shock to anyone who's got their eyes open. That's not a surprise. The guy's always been a fraud. He's been in politics like his entire life. You mean to tell me he's not a crook? Yeah, right. Right. D.C. is full of these people that take bribes. They're not really in charge because they can be bought. So the people with the money are the ones who are in charge. 
because there's nobody with integrity to establish this kingdom, as it were. Isaiah chapter 1, you don't have to turn there. Isaiah chapter 1, verse 21 reads, How has the faithful city become an harlot? Think about that. The faithful city, the one that was virtuous and righteous and true, has become a harlot. It's a harlot, someone for sale. How has the faithful city become an harlot? It was full of judgment, righteousness lodged in it, but now murderers. Thy silver has become dross, thy wine mixed with water, thy princes are rebellious. And, now, and, and when you hear the word princes, it's, like, it's their, their principles, the people in charge. Right? These are the rulers. The princes, thy princes are rebellious and companions of thieves. Everyone loveth gifts and followeth after rewards. They judge not the fatherless, neither doth the cause of the widow come unto them. They don't care about what's right, they care about money. They get sold out. And that's why a city that once was great, that once was faithful, that once was full of judgment, that once had integrity, that once stood on the things that were important, the things that God teaches, he says, now they've just become a whore. Now they're just this harlot. Now they're just this, this you know, they're, they're worthless. No one has any respect for them anymore because they're just bought out because they receive gifts. And that's what it's talking about when you see that uh, the references to receiving gifts. So don't worry, it's still okay to receive gifts on Christmas or whatever like that. You don't have to, you don't have to be that offended. But I'll tell you what, anybody who has any level of authority or uh, a, a position to judge needs to be careful for this. I know as a pastor, I need to be careful of this. I can't just be going around just accepting a bunch of gifts from people you know, in the congregation or whatever. Now, um, there's nothing wrong with, with a gift here and there. And that's, you know, again, it's not what this is talking about. It's talking about being bought. So like someone giving you a, a little gift or something, that's not a big deal. Friends do that, right? And there's no reason not to be friendly with anybody. I'm not saying give me gifts. I'm just saying that, that if there's, you know, anybody just normally gives gifts, nothing wrong with that at all. Even to someone who is in a position to give authority. There's a difference between being nice to somebody and being friendly and doing something nice for someone and buying that person. It's going to be obvious, you know, when, when someone is after your judgment, if you're a righteous man, if you're a position of authority or a position of judgment, people are going to be coming after you, trying to buy you. It's going to be, I mean, it's going to be extravagant. It's going to be big. And that's what you need to be able to say no. And even if it's a small, you know, a small job that you have or whatever, a small level, just be, be aware of that. Um, and don't let your, your mind be clouded from righteous judgment because of what some people do. You know, and, and pastors suck, get sucked into this all the time from the people who put a lot of money in the plate. And, uh, you know, you might, you might realize, hey, there's so-and-so has been coming here and they've just been, man, they've been throwing all kinds of money in the plate. But when it comes time to preaching on something that you know they're guilty of, you know, many pastors then withhold that because they don't want to offend the person with all the money thrown in the plate. And that's wicked. That's wrong. You've just been bought. You've just compromised. You've just become the harlot. And that's not very loving anyways. I mean, maybe that person, you know, who are you to, to think that anyways? I mean, wouldn't you, of all people then, wouldn't you say, hey, if this person really seems to be in this, I'm going to let them know about this because that's going to help them. And that's where the love comes in anyways. That's where the true love is, is letting people know. And you know what? Either they're going to be able to handle it or not. And if, you, if they're wise, he'll receive instruction. If he hates his own soul, then he'll hate instruction. But either way, the money should have nothing to do with what you say and what you preach. Verse number 29, the last verse, The Lord is far from the wicked, but he heareth the prayer of the righteous. You want God to hear your prayers? Be righteous. Live a good life. God will listen to you. As far as I have a word of prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, Lord, we thank you so much for these great words of wisdom. Lord, I pray that you please help us to keep a good filter on our mouths. Help us to understand the power that our words truly have to be able to use a good word fitly spoken. Dear Lord, how good is that? I pray that you please help us to remember all of those in our church, dear Lord, especially those that haven't been making it very much and those that are in need right now. God, I pray that you please help us to remember them and to... Um, you know, maybe visit them, call them, and, and um, provide some kind words for those people, dear Lord, and help us to, um, to just be able to receive instruction and correction, dear Lord, and that you would work in our hearts and help us to be the best children we could possibly be, dear Lord. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.